real people. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God bless you for being here. Right now our guests are greeting one another. Join us as though you were right here in the room. In just a moment you'll hear our incredible music director Mary Smith kick off the worship service. Just enjoy. Anytime you want, Mary, I'm just going to do this real quick. Why is she running? Oh, there we go. Oh, it's got a counter. How awesome. How many songs before the sermon? Two? Okay.
Thursday at Cracker Barrel and Burlington at 11.30 a.m. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
will be happy. The truth is, Lord, true happiness and contentment comes for you. May we look to the example of the Apostle Paul who said, because of you, he had learned in whatever state he was therewith to be content. It is not, Lord, about what we have or what we don't have. It is simply about the fact that we can be secure in our salvation with you. You are everything, Lord, and may we never forget that. In your precious name, amen. You may, be, you may remain standing. So if you're seated, if you could get back up, okay? Because we're going to read our scripture. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 25. We stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 25. Chapter 7 is after chapter 6, before chapter 8. All righty. And where's verse 15, Donna? After verse 14 and before verse 16. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 25. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheets of clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. So very, every good tree bears good fruit, but bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Be he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. May God bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. I'm going to uh, probably irritate today. And I'm going to irritate because I felt the need, felt called by the Lord to address something that needs to be addressed. Now, I've addressed it a few times in little uh, snide remarks and little whimsical comments, which really and truly did not honor God to address it that way. So I've decided instead of just making this little remark here and there and hoping someone will ask me so that I can explain it fully, I'm going to instead take it on as an entire message. I have shared this part before, that I believe the biggest crisis facing the church today, and indeed probably the church in America more than anywhere else, is biblical ignorance. I can't count how many times I have heard someone plunge into a lifestyle, or how many times I've heard a preacher say something that was clearly out of sync with the Word of God, and everybody be okay with it, and people buy into it. I have even heard old adages quoted as though they were scripture. Well, you know, Pastor, like they say, you can't teach an old, like the Bible says, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's a good saying. The Bible doesn't say it. You know, Pastor, like they say, like the Bible says, a watch pot never boils. Good saying, but the Bible doesn't say it. Are you following me? People hear old timeless sayings, and sometimes there's nothing wrong with them, but don't credit them to scripture if, in fact, they're not scripture. Because what happens then is then we look at other wise or sometimes unwise pity little sayings and we attribute them to be biblical authority and they in fact are not. I am concerned as our nation continues to go in a downward spiral culturally, regardless of who's in office, that we who are Christians, if we don't know scripture, are going to get sucked into things. And we're going to practice things and believe things and attribute things and teach things that are clearly unbiblical. We have already started giving approval and even calling Christianity things and religions and denominations that are clearly not. That's an issue. Probably one of the greatest dangers 
in Christianity today is the false teaching that goes on. I'm always the last one in my house awake. And sometimes late at night, a commercial comes on by some guy that I had never heard from before named Peter Popoff. Now he's popping off, let me tell you. So he is aptly named. Peter Popoff is selling, in the name of God, Miracle Spring Water. You can get your Miracle Spring Water in a tube. Little, like a shampoo packet like you see at the motels. And you can drink it or whatever that he wants you to do with it, I guess. And you're, you're guaranteed healing. You're guaranteed. There were people on this commercial saying, I was, I was in debt and I, I drank this Miracle Spring Water and now I'm rich beyond belief. I had cancer and I drank this Miracle Spring Water and now I've got a clean bill of health. All because you wrote Peter Popoff, I love that name, and he sent you Miracle Spring Water. And yet we are here giggling, but it must be something that is successful because people are buying it. And how much more silly is some of the other things that you and I hear and we buy into it. That's outwardly silly. But there are some outwardly silly doctrines that there are people in my own congregation and in congregations around the nation that buy into it because it sounds good, feels good, smells good, but it's wrong. There was a time I, I taught history for a number of years. There was an age in America called the Gilded Age. It was named by a saying by Mark Twain because he said a lot of times things look pretty on the outside because they're spray painted right or because they're painted golden but inside it's nothing but rust and corruption there's a lot of doctrines a lot of things that people are trying to sell you on TV, in books, on radio in your own backyard that sound good, sound Jesus-y but they are clearly not they are spray painted beautiful to make you think that they are to honor God but they are lies straight from the pit of hell this goes on, and I need you to understand this. I have seen and heard, not seen, but heard of people die tragic deaths because some evangelist told them that if they really had faith, they would forego all medication, all doctor's treatment, and just wait for God to heal them. You say, well, what's wrong with that, Pastor? I got news for you. God uses doctors. You say, well, wait a minute, but what if that doctor's not a Christian? What if that doctor is an atheist? You're going to tell me that God will still use an atheistic doctor? Yes. Because if you look in Scripture, God spoke through the lost in many, in, in many occasions, just as he spoke through those who were believers. Balaam, who's one of the, uh, who spoke several oracles in the Old Testament, was a soothsayer, was not a believer, did not follow after God, but God used him. So when you say, well, I won't go to the doctors because they're not Christians. I'm sorry, there's a word in Hebrew for that. It's called, seriously? God provided an opportunity for you to get treatment, sometimes at, at little cost, but because some shyster on TV told you to stay away from it, you're going to not pursue that? Oh my goodness, folks. I need you to hear this. Years ago, there was a young con artist, preacher named Hobart Freeman. While I was researching false preachers, this is one of the earliest that I could find. His church had established a beautiful auditorium inside a refurbished barn. In fact, they called their uh, worship center the barn. Very creative. It was packed. It was packed even on Sunday nights. People left their communities and traveled 30 to 70 to 100 miles to attend. And this dynamic preacher would preach his version of the Bible couple named Jack and Mary regularly attended the barn on Sunday nights. And in time, the glory barn and its faith assemblies, as he called them, began to infer, if not outright teach, that if you had enough faith, you would need to go to a doctor or be healed. In fact, if you went to a doctor, it was a sign you didn't have faith. Jack was diabetic. And he believed that preacher in his teachings. And after several incidents where he blacked out because he hadn't taken his medicine, he died of a lack of insulin. Jesus said, watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. 
People die physically and spiritually at the hands of false prophets because wolves devour their prey. You know what these wolves are hungry for, these false prophets? You want to say money, that's all they are. Oh, they're hungry for money. No. They're hungry for you. Paul warned in Acts chapter 20, he said this. He said, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men and women, or men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. You see, wolves, false prophets, desire you. Because you're their power base. You give them importance. You become their flock. They want to feel important, like they mean something, like they're successful. They want to be successful in the world's eyes, never mind God's eyes. And if you flock to their buildings, if you buy their books, if you buy into some of the goofy things that they promote, you've given them exactly what they want. They're hungry for you. Are you following me on this? Jude, very short book. One... uh, one little tiny book right in the middle of the New Testament condemns these, and it's actually, uh, my writing is wrong on what Bridget wrote. She has trouble reading my writing. It's my fault, not hers. It's only one book. So it's not Jude chapter 4. That's Jude verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, and verse 13. But it says this. It says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men. Listen to this. They are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and denied Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. These men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand and what things they do not understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals. These are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown away by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted twice dead. <coughs> now the way Jude describes them, you think they were some kind of three-headed monsters that could be easily seen and easily identified. But that's not the case. Satan is described as an angel of light. They don't hand out calling cards saying, hello, I'm an enemy of God. Hello, I'm here to destroy your spirituality. Hello, I'm here to deviate you from the scripture and even make you turn against your own called ministers because they will say that I'm wrong. They don't say that. They disguise themselves to gain your confidence because it's easier to deceive if they look just like you. You know, at one time, the cover on the Jehovah's Witness Bible was green. It eventually got changed to black. You know why? Because most Christian Bibles at the time were black covers. Jehovah Witnesses want to look like you. So when they come to their door, they quote from Scripture. Why? Because they want to sound like you. They want to sound authoritative. They want to draw you in. They want you to go, oh, they said Scripture. It made me feel all ooey-gooey inside. They must be real. Are you following me? Now some of you, I can already tell you, are going to get mad at me for saying this. But it has to be said because one of my jobs as a called pastor of God is to be the shepherd. And the shepherd is to protect you from the wolves. I almost envy the actual shepherd. Because when the actual shepherd, the real one that looks after real sheep, says, hey, move over this way, there's a wolf coming. More than likely, those sheep don't go, well, I'm very offended that you would call that a wolf. But I get this all the time. I can't believe you said that. Oh, my goodness, you dare say that? If I don't say that, I betray my calling to God. I am disobedient. I am not who God called me to be. And if I truly care about you, if I truly love you, if you are truly my congregation and I don't call it out, it's on me. And shame on me for not doing so. And if it offends you, please understand that it is said in love. It is said because I care very deeply for you. It is said because I want you and I to grow in Christ together. And I cannot do that if I keep my mouth shut when we chase false prophets. 
You say, well, if they disguise themselves, how are we supposed to recognize them? Well, Jesus said you can know them by their fruits. So you have to ask yourself some questions. Do they, number one, do they teach another God? In the Old Testament, or another Jesus, in the Old Testament, God's people were told in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 4, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to it. In other words, you're going to run into people who make a prediction of the future and it ends up being right, who appear to do miraculous things and will do those things while quoting scripture, but then begin to lead you in a direction that contradicts the word of God. And the temptation will be to say, yeah, that, that's not what they taught me in Sunday school. That's not what I understand from my preacher. That's not what I understand scripture to be. But did you see what he just did? Did you see the prediction that came true? So even though the entire word of God seems to be negated by this person, he sure sounds good and he did some amazing things. If they're teaching another Jesus, they're false prophets. 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 through 23. The apostle wrote, I do not write to you because... You do not, I do not write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is an antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Now listen to me. Hear me on this. There are some religions that will tell you we do believe that Jesus is real. And yet they will also tell you that you can become just like him. And they will also tell you that he was another great prophet. So when they teach you Jesus, they are not teaching you the accurate Jesus because he was more than a prophet. And I can do everything this side of heaven that I wanted to to try to be like him, which is my goal and aim. But because I am a sin-filled creature, I will never reach that. There is only one Savior. Do they teach another God? Do they teach another Jesus? And by and large, do they teach another gospel? Galatians 1, 8 says, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let them be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody preaches you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be eternally condemned. Now here's where it's going to sting. One of the biggest falsehoods out there today is the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Oh, it sounds good. They'll quote the same scriptures that you hear me quote, and that's what trips you up. Pastor, you preached on that message. He preached on that same scripture. But then they'll throw in the tiniest little illusion that success and physical health is an absolute sign of a right walk with Jesus. They never preach about Job or talk about Paul being stoned or in prison just for preaching the gospel. They'll never tell you those things. But they'll tell you that if you just follow after Jesus, you're guaranteed success. You're guaranteed that you'll be healthy. You're guaranteed that you'll prosper. But if you trip up, if there's a hardship in your life, it must be because you did not follow after Jesus. And that can trip up any of us, including yours truly. Events of this past year have had me so messed up that as things went on, I even said to my wife one time, and if she was not a nonviolent person, she would have slapped me, but she verbally slapped me down. Because I said to her, I said, maybe, maybe we're not doing right. And that's why some of this has happened. Why there have been some friendships lost and a, and a loss of, 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 of relationship of one of the most important relationships in our life. And maybe, maybe that's why this has happened. And she said, what are you talking about? She said, I'm not saying we're perfect. We're not. 
She said, but we are trying to pursue Jesus with everything we've got. It rains on the just and the unjust. Don't do that to yourself. And she basically told me, get behind me, Satan. And she was right. Not because I stand on a high spiritual pillar. I don't. I struggle with all the same sins you struggle with. But it doesn't mean that when bad things fall upon me, it is because of that. Sometimes things happen to test our faith. Sometimes things happen so that we can be a witness to others. You see, the false prophets, the health, wealth, and prosperity preachers are playing you. And you get mad at those who are sounding the alarm against them. I'm pleading with you, be wary of them. Do they teach another book? Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. says, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Listen carefully. Anytime you see a supplement to Scripture, or some preacher has received a new word that goes beyond Scripture or contradicts it, you better run fast and run far. The Bible is timeless. Rob Bell, who at one time led one of the greatest evangelistic churches in the nation, suddenly decided that there was not a hell and suddenly decided that we needed to abandon this 2,000-year-old book of letters, he called it, and just pursue relationships. The problem with that is what the Bible said back then and says now, it's still the Word of God. Everything else may change, change, but the Word of God endures forever. And that's the way that it is. Now, how do you protect yourselves against wolves? Well, first of all, you need to know your Bible. Good deal. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16, tells us that we need to listen to our preachers and teachers and so on. We need to be deeply ingrained in the fellowship and teaching of the Scriptures. We need to do that so that we can grow up strong and be vigilant against evil. I want you to understand this because a lot of us, a lot of us, in fact, I dare say more Christians in churches don't know Scripture than do. You have relied totally on believing whatever somebody with a microphone tells you or whatever somebody on television tells you, and I will constantly tell you, prove me wrong. Go to the Word of God with an accurate interpretation of Scripture and prove me wrong. Because if I'm wrong, I'm going to stand up the next week and say, my goodness, they showed me I need to apologize to you because the last thing I want to do is incorrectly interpret the Word of God to you. In fact, that scares me because I don't want to ever do that. I don't want to ever be guilty of incorrectly expounding upon the Word of God and giving you a false idea of what's out there. Now, I need you to hear this. Because ultimately, the only way you can overcome biblical ignorance is to quit being biblically ignorant. I've been bringing this up for two or three years now, and people say to me, yeah, you're right, I hear you say that, but I just don't know the Bible, and I don't know how I'm going to learn it. We pass out this little thing to you every week called a bulletin. Inside that bulletin, it tells you what Sunday school classes are offered. And if you are not a morning person, you can't get up for Sunday school. It tells you about four or five different small groups meeting at people's houses, sometimes in people's churches, or sometimes in our church, where you can go and learn the Word of God and hear accurate interpretations of it and grow deeper in your walk with God. So when you stay home and you do not participate, and then you say, I don't know the Bible, guess what? It is your fault. We are giving you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And there is a need right now as the world continues to distort the word of God that you and I know it. In ancient China, I thought this story was incredible. Gym merchants would often take an apprentice to study the craft of selecting, cutting, and selling rare stones. And one young man came to a master and said, I I want to be an apprentice. And the craftsman said, okay, go home, come back tomorrow, we'll get started. The next day, the apprentice arrived and he said, here's a ruby. All I want you to do is sit in the corner and hold it. That's all I want you to do. So all day long, he just sat in the corner holding that ruby. And he did the same thing the next day and the next day and the next day. In a couple of weeks, the apprentice was 
getting frustrated. And he said, why are you treating me this way? Are you making a joke of this? I told you I wanted to learn the craftsmanship. I told you I wanted to learn about the cutting and the selling and, and the making of, of jewelry with rare stones. I told you I wanted to do this. The craftsman didn't say a word. But he picked up a stone and he put it in the young man's hand and said, here you go. And the apprentice looked at it and said, that's not a ruby. He had learned to know the authenticity of a stone by constantly being exposed to the real thing. So when you tell me, this is as blunt as I can get, I don't have time for Bible study. I don't have time for Sunday school. I don't have time for small group. I am way too busy. But you have time to hear someone falsely present the word of God. There's a problem. I can't say it enough. And I won't quit saying it. You cannot grow in Christ without a regular time in the Word. You need to be learning Scripture. Because there are those out there trying to steal your soul. At the very least, mislead you to keep from sharing the truth of Christ with others. Plug in, not for the sake of a church. I'm not out to promote numbers. But I am out to see Christianity begin to be revived in our nation but an accurate interpretation of what the Bible defines as Christianity. And the only way that that can happen is for the person in the auditorium in the seat to decide that they're going to get real about knowing the Word of God. Now let me give you a warning on this. I've said this before. You're not going to always enjoy what you read. I do not always enjoy reading my Bible. I have said this to you before. You know why I don't always enjoy reading it? Now, the press would have a field day. They take that sound bite right there. Preacher says he doesn't always enjoy reading his Bible. And it would be true. I don't. You know why? Because sometimes it's like looking in a mirror and not liking what I see. See, if I don't read the Word of God, I can convince myself that I'm doing okay. I'm all right. Look how happy I am. Look how things are going. I'm all right. But there are times that I read the Word of God and it convicts me of something that maybe nobody else knows about, but it's in my thought life, in my personal life, in my private life, and I will go, oh, my goodness, Lord, no. I don't like it. But what I choose to do is follow the Holy Spirit's conviction, repent, and go the direction I need to go. It's a lot like the workouts that I do, Lee. If I don't look at the pictures... And I hate those pictures, by the way, that they post on Facebook after a workout. I come out of those workouts after so many burpees and lifting weights and everything else. I come out feeling like I am 70 pounds lighter. I am muscle bound. I look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his good day. Okay? I feel great. And then someone says, here's a picture of you at the workout today. I go, oh, my goodness. But I keep going to workout because I know that it's good for me to do. I keep reading my scripture. Because I know of the power of transformation that the Holy Spirit can use through the reading of it. Listen to me and hear me. And please, if you leave here offended, there's nothing I can do about it. Absolutely nothing. But I pray that you understand. There are people out there presenting things that are contradictory to the Word of God. Some of you have known me for a long time. You know that I love you, or at least you have an inkling that I might. You know that if you needed me, I would come to your home. You know that there is a deep care on the part of your pastor for each and every one of you. And some of you have had an opportunity. This isn't tooting my own horn. Just follow me through. You've had an opportunity to see us minister to you. So I ask you, why would we tell you that something was wrong just to start an argument unless it really was wrong? Maybe quit trying to debate and say, okay, pastor, show me. I don't want to fight with you. Show me. I'll sit down with you for as long as it takes in order to steer you a direction that is more god honor and what you're learning. I need you to understand this. Because ultimately it scares me that some of this is on the rise. It scares me that some of it is becoming more and more popular with every passing day. 
it scares me that I've been called out even by other preachers for how dare I say that this is wrong. That actually happened. But what even scares me more is that I might misrepresent God's word to you. And then I dishonor him. So as much as I hate offending people, and I really do, I was reminded today that I can be quite the people pleaser. I would rather offend you than offend the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you've given us the truth. You tell us in John 8, 32, and in John 14, 6, and in other scriptures that you are the truth. And the truth shall set us free. God, forgive us that many times, myself included, we have been in bondage to false doctrine. Let us seek after you. In your precious name, amen. Now as you stand, let me also tell you, there is a truth that can be summed up in one word, Jesus. But not just what you think Jesus ought to be, but what the word of God shows that he is. You see, when we present to you the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of what he did on the cross, the fact that he rose from the grave, we are not saying to you, please be perfect. Please have no past. Please always do the right thing. Because if we did that, we'd be hypocrites. What we are trying to present to you is the fact that in spite of every hardship you go through, every time you fall down and stumble, every time you hurt, every time that you deal with issues, it may not be the result of your sin, but the fact is that sin exists, and the only answer to it is Jesus. And while I will not guarantee you that he's going to, make, he's going to give you an instant cure-all for everything that is going on in your life, boy, you're going, to, you're going to drop all the way, your relationships are going to come back together, everything is going to be wonderful. I'm not going to tell you that, but here's what I'm going to tell you. Philippians 4 calls it a peace that passes all understanding. There's that peace that you get from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's when you can sit there when your world is falling apart and still manage to feel a peace. And everybody else looks at you and thinks you're crazy. It's not that you're crazy, it's that you have learned who rules your life and who's in control. For some of you today, you have never entered into that relationship with Jesus. If you were to die today, you can't guarantee you'd be in heaven. In fact, you don't think anybody has that guarantee. But I can tell you 100% for sure that I'm going to be in heaven someday. And it's not because I'm a fat Texas preacher. But it's because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Who loves me in spite of myself. And died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. And just as he overcame death and rose from the grave. One day when I die, I will in an instant be transported to the kingdom of God. To enjoy eternal life. That is the truth of the gospel. And if you don't have that relationship with Jesus, there is nothing more I'd like to do today than talk to you about that. Some of you, you know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you have decided that now is the time to pursue a church home. You've been a Christian, but you have for a long time not been involved in any church. And you're realizing now that you need to hook into a church family. Boy, we'd welcome you. Just come up and talk to us about it. In just a moment, when they start singing, we're going to give you that opportunity. That opportunity to come forward and say, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. That opportunity to come forward and say, I want to be a part of this church family. Or even that opportunity to come forward and say, I'm still praying through this. I'm praying through this issue, this problem. Some of the things you said, Pastor, did offend me. But I also know that I need to research and look and see what the Holy Spirit has to say. So we're going to have an invitation. I'm going to stand down here. The microphone's going to be off. You're going to say, well, there's no way I'm going to walk in front of everybody. I know about Baptists. They're all going to go to the restaurant and talk about it later. wonder why I went forward. That's why I have four people in the back. You can walk backward and they'll talk to you. They'd be glad to talk to you. But either way, if, if God is speaking to your heart, you know what the worst thing you can do is? Ignore him. If he's speaking to your heart, even if it's right there where you're standing, 
do something about it as the music plays. The invitation is open. One thing we did not put on the video today because it is today is the feeding of the homeless. Tim Dye and his crew and whoever wants to go with him uh, are going to leave here about two, I believe, a little after, maybe a little before. 
okay? And they're going to be feeding the homeless in downtown Fort Worth. They're taking beef stew. Some have brought some up. I still have to run and get it, but I'm going to bring some up for him, okay? So any of y'all can do that because there's a, I've been out there with him. There's a crew of people that show up, and, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing, okay? And so if you want to go, Tim is that good-looking guy that was at that table a minute ago, all right? Okay. Um, all right, so if uh, we're going to have our time of worship now through offering. And so if our ushers will come forward, what we simply ask that you do is that you give as God would lead you. If you are a member, then the, uh, certainly we would expect you, um, we have no way of tracking it, so don't worry about that, but we would expect you to give of, uh, of your tithe. If you are visiting with us, the biggest thing we want from you is just the, for you to continue being either a part of this fellowship or a fellowship somewhere nearby. In other words, continue being part of church. If God leads you to give, that's gravy. But what we really want is for you to continue to pursue your relationship with Christ. We actually want that from everybody, but we're specifically talking to our visitors on that. Around you are envelopes. They have my offering written on them. They also have, there's also a solid white offering. The offering that says my offering is for strictly your tithe for the general fund of our church. The other one is for, we call it our extravagance fund. It's for ministries that may not impact First Baptist Lillian, but will impact the kingdom of God. Okay, and so prayerfully consider what God would have you do with each of those envelopes. I really hope, we're not done yet, but I'm going to say this real quick. I really hope you'll be back here at 6 p.m. tonight. Uh, I talked to this man on the phone the other day. I told him, I said, you know, we, don't, we haven't traditionally done Sunday nights in a long time. I don't know what you can expect. He said, Pastor, I have been in churches that had 14 there. I'm just glad to be able to sing for the Lord and minister to others. So let's try to have just a few more than 14, okay? Because I'm really excited that this guy has that attitude and that spirit. Mary's the one that plugged it in, so we want to support her for that. And so we hope you'll be here at 6 o'clock tonight, okay? Guaranteed, be home by midnight, okay? So just be here at 6, okay? Probably wouldn't be more than an hour. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give back to you because you gave all. In your precious name, amen. Thank you for listening to the First Baptist Church of Real People, the First Baptist Church of Lillian, Texas. That message was a little tough. If God is leading you to respond to it, respond to Pastor Hope at iCloud.com. If you wish to give to the ministries of this church, you can find us on SimpleTithe.com, PayPal at FBC, or excuse me, info at FBCLillian.com. If you'd like to talk to me directly, call 817-790-5757. Thank you for listening. God bless you.